um, cylindrical shells were thinking about sort of like having a very, very thin cylinder, or like a very, very ho thin hollow cylinder like this, let's say, um, that you are using as a portion of the volume that you're looking for. And then you're sticking another very, very um, thin hollow cylinder inside of that that may, you know, it may stick out a little bit further than this one does. It may have a little bit larger height, a little smaller radius, right? And then you might have another one that has a little bit larger height and a little smaller radius inside of that one. Um, sort of like the analogy I like to use is like the Russian nesting dolls where you open one up and there's another one inside of it and you open another one up, there's another one inside of it, right? There's layers to this thing. It's like, uh, you know, like you peel off the skin of an onion and you, you know, there's a layer of onion and you can peel that off and there's a layer of onion. What was it's that? Like, an ogre. like a what? Like an ogre. Like an ogre? Yogurt? Oh. Like yogurt? No, 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 no. Like Shrek, like an ogre. They have layers. Does ogre anybody does layers. anybody know what he's talking about? Ogres have layers. Ogre, like, like the like magical, whatever, mythical, whatever, pretend creature thing. Yep. They have layers. It is an artful cultural reference, according to Derek. Okay, nice job with your artful cultural reference. That was, that was well done, yes. Like an ogre, I guess. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, layers to this thing, sort of, right? Like there's one inside of the next one, and there's another one inside of that, and another one inside of that, and so on until um, the height basically is the entire length of your largest part of your interval, and it's very, very narrow and small, so little piece. Um, so that's what we're looking. So what we want to do, so is normally we'll sketch a little rectangle inside of our function like this, and we take that little rectangle, and that's what we revolve around the axis that we're supposed to be revolving it around to get these shells. So we graph it and we draw a typical rectangle that is parallel to the axis that we're revolving around. I'm going to sort of sketch one of those, figure out if the thickness is dx or dy. So like in this example, the thickness here would be a thickness of dx if I were to draw my rectangle this way and revolve it around something, right? We'd end up with this thing would be like a a thickness of dy. So if we're going to revolve around a horizontal axis, it has to be done in terms of y. If we're going to revolve around a vertical axis, it has to be done in terms of x. Uh, then we find a generic representation of the radius and of the height or the altitude. And then we just use the formula for the volume of, or not the volume, but the lateral surface area of a cylinder, 2 pi r h, right, circumference times the height. And we multiply that by the thickness, the dy or the dx, to find the volume of one shell. And then we use an integral to sum together all of the shells. Does that sort of make sense what we're going to do? Yeah. All right. Spectacular. So let's take this region that is bounded by our curve y equals root x the x-axis and the line x equals four, and we're gonna revolve it around the x-axis to make a solid. So I've, yeah, this one's already sort of all labeled out because I just took a picture out of the textbook for you, but this is the general picture. We wanna revolve around the x-axis, which is a horizontal axis. So we draw the rectangle or just this little line here that we've drawn here. We draw that parallel to that, so horizontally, Then we're gonna revolve it around, right? And as we revolve it around, um, we should have a thickness to this that is in which direction? Isn't it dy? Should be dy, yep. All right, so this thickness is of dy. So that means we need to do everything in terms of y. And then we need to figure out what is the um, 
radius of an average one of these and what is the height of one of these. And so we would note first off that the radius, if we're revolving around the x-axis, is just going to be this y value. Right, our radius should always just be y if we're revolving around the x-axis. And if we're revolving around the y-axis, our radius should always just be x. So our radius is y. Then we look for our height. And our height should be the longest that this could be, 4, minus however far over we go, x. And then we have to write our function, um, y equals root x, which we'll solve that for x to figure out that is in terms of y. They've already done that for us. So that gives us a height of 4 minus y squared for the height of any of these cylindrical shells. So our formula just becomes 2 pi times our 4 minus y squared times our y. <clears throat> times our thickness dy, and we integrate it from the lower limit in terms of y, that's zero, to our upper limit, which is two. Everybody good with that? Beautiful. Hi. And then now it's, I should have written an integral there. An integral from zero to two, four uh, y minus y cubed dy, or two pi times the integral of four y ought to be what? Should be two y squared right? minus y to the fourth over four from zero to two, and what does that give us? Two pi times plug in a two to that. What is that? It's eight minus four, and then minus zero for the whole second part of it, or 8 pi units cubed. Now, this one would actually have been really easy to do using uh, disks, right? using our slicing method. But just as an illustration here, this is how we would do it using shells. Good or no? Yeah. Cool. All right. That is shells. We'll do a couple more um, and then uh, and we'll move on to arc length. So we're going to take the region in the first quadrant that is bounded by 4 minus x squared. So that's going to look something like that. And the curves y equals 3x, which is, uh, if I could get that to go through the origin, that'd be better. y equals 3x, and x equals 0. So that's our y axis, right? So we're bounding this region right here. I'll sketch it in a lighter color. This region. And we're going to revolve it around the y axis. And so we want to do this using shells. So if we're going to revolve around the y axis, when we sketch our rectangle, we need to make it parallel to that y-axis. And good enough. And then we're going to revolve it around there, right? Something like that. So what's the thickness? Dx. Should be dx this time. What's the radius? Wait, yep. well, it's different depending on, like, well, yeah, x. Nope. But. It's not different depending on anything. It's always x. It's always however far I go over from the origin to here. My radius is always just x. And I may go over here and have a radius of x, or I may go all the way over to here and have a radius of still x. What about my height or my altitude here? That ought to be the distance from this top function to this bottom function. What's the distance 
between the top function and the bottom function. It should be the difference between them. So upper function minus lower function. Good or no? Good. Okay. And now we have our radius, we have our thickness, we have our height. So our integral should be two pi, and then it should be four minus x squared minus three x times x, which we can distribute out right away, I think. It'd be four x minus x cubed minus three x squared dx. And then we have to figure out where we're integrating from in terms of x. So we know we're starting at zero, right? But we gotta figure out what this intersection point is. So we'll go over here and say, well, four minus x squared equals three x. That'd be if x squared plus three x minus four equals zero. And we'll factor that and get x equals one and x equals negative four. Clearly the one we're looking for is the one in the positive x values. So we'll integrate from zero to one. Good or no? Any questions, any issues there? Can we integrate to x squared minus x to the fourth over four minus x cubed from zero to one? And we get two pi times two minus a fourth minus one minus zero. And what does that come out to be? Let's see, that's three fourths times two, so that should be three halves, three pi over two units cubed. Good or no? Good. Any questions, any issues there with these cylindrical shells? All right. Here are two more. I'd like you guys to uh, see if you can do these two on your own. You don't necessarily need to evaluate the integrals. Just try and set these two up on your own. So we've got the region between 2x minus 1, the y-axis, and root x. And we're going to revolve it around x equals negative 2. And we're going to revolve it around x equals 5. So I'm going to see if you guys can get those two set up on your own. I'll give you two or three minutes to see if you can do that. Sound good? Great. All right, ready to go. All right, so first off, hopefully we sketched it. So 2x minus 1 and root x and x equals 0. Okay. So we're looking at this whole region right here in yellow. And not necessarily bounded by the x-axis, didn't say first quadrant or anything. So looking at that region. And we're going around something over here, x equals negative 2. That is vertical. So we'll sketch our rectangle vertically. And we'll revolve it around there. That looks awful, but that's what it's going to generally look like. <clears throat> All right. So what is, first off, the thickness? dx. Should be dx. Okay. And what about our radius? Is it x plus 2? Yep. It's this distance from here to here, which is 2 plus this distance, which is x. So 2 plus x, x plus 2, however you want to write it, it's fine. And what about the height? Root x minus 2x minus 1. Yep, root x minus 2x minus 1. And where would we need to integrate from? We'd have to figure out where 2x minus 1 equals root x. That's probably pretty clear where that is. That's x equals what? One. Yep. So 
We're going to integrate from x equals 0 to x equals 1. 2 pi radius. Thickness and height. Good. And that what y'all got for that one. And yeah, it's like evaluating, whatever, not a big deal. You can distribute it through and do the arithmetic. Yeah. All right. How would this change then if we were instead of revolving around x equals negative two, we'd revolve around x equals five? Would the thickness change? No. Nope, still dx, right? The x equals one would still be the same. What about our radius? It should be five minus x. That should become five minus x, because now this distance from wherever we're going to the x-axis, that's our x. And then this whole thing is 5. So the radius is 5 minus that little x. And the height should still be the same, root x minus 2x plus 1 if I distribute the minus through. And so this one should be 2 pi times an integral from 0 to 1 of 5 minus x, root x minus 2x plus 1, dx. Good or no? Perfect. Cool. So on some occasions, there will be issues with, um, you know, maybe converting one function into the other variable to do it using shells or using disks or washers. And so if that's the case, if it's a problem or if it's difficult to do that, you can always just flip and use the other method. So you can always interchange between the two. Generally, both methods will work, but on some rare occasions, one method might not work, and so it's helpful to know the other method. Any questions or issues with these cylindrical shells? And you're welcome to use cylindrical shells for any problems on the homework. I don't think I required you to, um, but you're welcome to if you want to. For the AP test, we don't have to identify which method we're using, right? You do not. And like I said, you'll never have to. Every problem that has area on it or volume, sorry, that has volume on it on the AP test can be done using um, the slicing method or using like, a, you know, the cross-sectional area stuff, disks and washers, all that. Just sometimes those ones might require you to convert from one variable to the other, and you could potentially use this so that you don't need to convert the variables, and you're more than allowed to use it. It's not a problem that you use it at all. All right. Are we ready to move forward into some more new stuff? Yes. Perfect. All right. What's the length of this arc? Probably three. Hmm. Good guess. Could be right. Might not be. What's the distance from A to B? x squared plus y squared, um, and then the square root of that. I mean, not quite x squared plus y squared, but the change in x, right? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. We'll just, you know, it's, you know, x2 minus x1 or delta x squared plus delta y squared, right? That'd be the distance, right? Um, is that a good representation of the length of this arc, would you say? Maybe. No. Probably, probably not that great. I mean, if I looked at these two points right here, from here to here, it's clearly a lot less 
um, on the straight line than it is on the curve, right? And same from here to here, it's clearly a lot less on the straight line than it is on the curve. Yeah, would you guys agree with that? For sure. Yeah. Um, well, what if instead of doing that, what if this line here anymore? What if I broke this down at some other point and said, let's go from here to here? Could I find, if I knew the coordinates of that point, could I find the distance from here to here and then the distance from here to here? Yeah. It's just thing. Of the two distances. Right, it'd just be the two distances, right? Wouldn't that maybe be a better approximation for the length of this arc? than my original just straight line through the two points was. Yes. Hopefully so. What if I broke it down into this many points and did this length and this length and this length and this length? That's getting even closer, isn't it? Oh boy. Indeed. We see a pattern here, similar to what we did with area and what we do with volume, right? We break it down into these very small intervals, and then we just use an integral to sum them together, don't we? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, so if I could break this down into, oh gosh, I don't know, an infinite number of intervals between A and B, and find the length of each of those tiny little intervals, then when I summed them together, should become the exact length of this curve, shouldn't it? One would hope. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah, I think it is. So the problem with that is, I am sitting here looking at two different variables, right? Um, and if we think about this, Tell me about delta y on a very small scale. What's what is delta y equal to on a very small scale? Isn't it like delta x and the function? It's, isn't or, it what? It's equal to the um, the function of delta x, or like yeah, yeah sort of. It's it's equal to, we, we can approximate it using a derivative, right? Using the tangent line, which is what we're gonna have here is a bunch of little tiny lines, right? We're gonna have a bunch of tiny little lines. We can approximate delta y as equal to f prime of x, so the derivative, the slope of the tangent line of, x, of f at x times the change in x. Right. Isn't this what we did with differentials, right? The differential on y, the very small change in y is equal to the derivative of the function times how much we changed in x. True? Yes. Yeah, that's what we did with differentials way back well, last year, and we did it this year too, right? So one would then think, hopefully, that I should be able to rewrite this as the square root of delta x squared plus, since delta y is now going to be equal to this differential approximation of it, since we're going to have an infinite number of these, this should be exact. It should be equal to f prime of x times delta x squared. And with that, what should I be able to do? sum it with like an interval? Well, I could, but uh, it'd be nice if I simplify this a little bit first. Because delta x is not something we normally are just given. You could take, you could like um, square the f prime of x and then take the delta x squared out of the square root. All right, so yeah, we could write this I'll, I'll take it out in a second. We could write this as delta x. That doesn't really look like a delta. 
delta x squared, right? This has got a delta x squared. This has got a delta x squared. Factor the delta x squareds out of them, and I just get one plus f prime of x squared. Would you guys agree with that? Which would then become the square root of one plus f prime of x squared with a delta x outside the square root. And delta x is pretty much just dx. And delta x is just the dx that we need in order to integrate. So we'll call this now as we sum them all together, an integral from a to b of the square root of one plus f prime of x squared dx. And this formula right here will give you the length of any arc or any curve that you want to look at. Pretty cool, huh? That was so cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's just the same thing we do, right? Anytime we want to figure out what the sum of a bunch of little pieces of something is, we just use the integral. So if we want to find the length of something that's curved, we just sum together a bunch of infinitely tiny little pieces of it an infinite number of times and get the actual length of it, just like we did with area, just like we do with volume. Pretty cool. So let's see if we can find the length of the arc of this semi-cubical parabola, y squared equals x cubed, from the point 1, 1 to the point 4, 8. Thoughts on what we should do? Get the derivative. Or you have to do some stuff first, but get the derivative. Okay, so first off, yeah, we're going to need that to be like y equals, that'll be y equals x to the three halves, right? And so if we want to put it into an integral from one, the x value, to four, the other x value of the square root of one plus f prime, we need to find out what's the derivative of this. So what's the, what is y prime equal? It should be three halves x to the one half. And what will y prime squared be? So that'd be nine fourths x. Should be nine fourths x. Everybody good with that? Yeah. So we'll have one plus nine fourths x dx. And um, just for fun, how would we go about integrating this? U substitution. Yeah, we just do a u sub for u equals one plus nine fourths x. One plus nine fourths x. D would be nine fourths. Put in your nine fourths. Put in your four ninths on the outside, and the arithmetic becomes pretty darned unpleasant. So we'll just let the calculator approximate this for us. What do we get? Seven point six three four. Seven point six three four. Perfect. Is that what somebody else got to? Not that I don't trust you, Sean, but I feel like it's good to have confirmation there. 7.634? Yes, yep. no, maybe. I guess we won't get confirmation. I hope that's right. I also got that. Oh, good. All right. Let's see if we can do another one. We're going to find the length of y equals 1 plus 6x to the 3 halves from x equals 0 to x equals 1. So first off, we're going to need to figure out what is y prime. And what is y prime?
9 root x. It should just be 9 root x. And so what's y prime squared? It should just be 81x. So we integrate from 0 to 1. Square root of 1 plus 81x dx. Easy enough? Yeah. And what do we get? Six point one zero three. Somebody else get that also? I got that too. Perfect. Easy enough. A lot of the arc length ones um, come out to where the arithmetic's really gross, so a lot of time we'll just approximate them on our calculator. But let's do another one. This one we're going to do, yeah, this one we'll do uh, all the way by hand, so we're not going to use our calculators to approximate this one. In fact, you guys want to try and do this one on your own? Sounds good. All right. I'll give you guys, uh, I don't know, two or three minutes ought to be plenty. It's not, it's not like it's real difficult, but Good practice on your own. So two or three minutes. Ready, go. So your derivative of y, y prime was what? Should have been y over secant times the derivative of secant, which gave you what? Tangent. Tangent x, which told you that y prime squared was tangent squared x. So we are just going to integrate from 0 to pi over 4. Square root of 1 plus tangent squared x dx. And what's 1 plus tangent squared? Secant squared. Secant squared. And if we square root that secant squared, it just becomes secant. secant. And we should have the integral of secant memorized. What's the integral of secant? Natural log absolute value of secant plus tangent. Good. And we'll evaluate that from 0 to pi over 4, which will give us natural log absolute value of the secant of pi over 4. What's the secant of pi over 4? Root 2. Root 2. And the tangent of pi over 4 is? 1. 1. And then minus natural log absolute value of secant of 0 is? One. One and tangent of zero is zero. Zero. And so we end up with these are, these are both positive, so the absolute values are redundant. Natural log of one is zero, so that's gone. And so we just end up with natural log of root two plus one. Good or no? Is that what you all got? Indeed. Great. All right. <clears throat> we can also do these in terms of y if needed. So let's see if we can find the length of the arc of a parabola y squared equals x, so a parabola turned on its side, from the point 0, 0 to the point 1, 1. And we could do this either way. We could do it in terms of x or we could do it in terms of y, but we'll do it in terms of y. So. This time, instead of looking for the derivative of y, we're going to look for the derivative of x with respect to y. So dx dy is what should be 2y. Everybody agree with that? Yeah. And if we square that, right, dx dy squared ought to just be 2y squared. which ought to be 4y squared. And so we should be able to integrate from y equals 0 to y equals 1, the square root of 1 plus 4y squared dy. And what does that come out to be? One point four uh, 
seven nine. All right, very good. Somebody else get 1.479 also? Yep. Cool. Um, what if we had done it in terms of X instead of in terms of Y? What would that have looked like? just to prove that we could do it either way. We would have to rewrite it as y equals root x, right? And what would the derivative be? One over two root x. One over two root x. And that would tell us that our derivative squared was one over four x. And so we would have to do an integral from x equals zero to x equals one of the square root of one plus one over four x dx. And what does that come out to be? <clears throat> I sure hope that comes out to be unless we've done something horribly wrong. I'm just going to assume that it's 1.479, but somebody will confirm that on their calculator and tell us how amazing math is that we could do it in terms of either variable and it should still work. Right? This is true. Wonderful. It comes out to be 1.479. It's amazing how math works like that. Everybody good? Any issues with that? It's weird. I got like different approximations. Like it came out to about 1.479 both times, but once it gets down to like the fifth decimal, it's slightly different. Yeah, that'll happen. Mm -hmm. Just because it's approximating the integral and not giving you an exact value of it. Yeah. Uh, the exact value of each of those should be identical. <laughs> So if we actually went through and evaluated them, you know, by hand, um, it's like, you know, you could do the uh, top one is easily, pretty easily done just by doing a trig substitution, right? Letting u equal, um, or let y equal two tangent theta, right? Um, the other one, let's see, you have, to, you have to get a common denominator for that, and then it becomes a little more complicated, but it'll come out to be the same if you do this. Um, by hand. All right. So the important thing about doing arc length is that if the derivative of your function is ever undefined on the interval that you're looking at, you got to deal with it in some way. So if we wanted to find the length of x to the one third from the point negative eight, negative two to the point eight, two, we have a problem doing this in terms of x. And what's the problem doing this in terms of x? At zero y prime is undefined. Right. Y prime is one third x to the negative two thirds, which does not exist at x equals zero, right? Gives us a, um, gives us a vertical tangent line. In fact, that x equals zero. Doesn't it? And that's what the Hubert function looks like, right? Looks like this. It's got a, that was really poorly drawn, but. That was also really poorly drawn. Pretend that looks like a nice cubic flipped on its side. It's got a vertical tangent. Okay. Um, so what if we converted it then instead into terms of y? We'd say that x is equal to y cubed. And then what's the derivative of x with respect to y? It should be 3y squared. 3y squared doesn't have any issues between y equals negative 2 and y equals positive 2, does it? In fact, it doesn't have any issues anywhere. Agreed? Yeah, agreed. All right. 
So all we'd have to do then is integrate from negative two to two, the square root of one plus three y squared squared, or one plus nine y to the fourth dy, which would come out to be what? Seventeen point two six one. Sounds good to me. Somebody else agree with that? Yep. Cool. Any questions? Any issues? Any problems with that? If it didn't like come out nicely where we could do it in terms of um, in terms of y, then could we like split it up into two parts so that we don't have to deal with the zero and do it like from negative eight, negative two to zero and then from, or would that be bad because we're skipping the zero? Yeah, it, it's, it's not good because you're still having a zero value in there that um, is undefined. You're still trying to trip, you're still trying to integrate on a place where a piece of this thing is undefined. So that's, a, that's an issue for now. It's not an issue forever, but it's an issue for now. Okay. Yeah. Um, by the end of this week, we'll be able to integrate at places where <clears throat> um, where a function might not be defined. Sort of, sort of integrate at them, like an asymptote and stuff. And a vertical tangent line is um, more of an issue. Exciting. Or it is discontinuity. But yeah, very exciting. All right, let's do another one. This one has some issues to it also. What's the issue with this one between x equals negative 4 and x equals 4? Yeah. Uh, somebody said in the chat here, it's got a corner. Thank you, Ryan. It's got a corner at x equals zero, right? Because of the four absolute value of x. And so um, in this case, because it's just a simple corner, it's not like a discontinuity or anything. Weird. In fact, actually, if I think about it a little more, that last one, the vertical tangent line, should work if we went just from negative eight to zero and zero to eight should be OK. Um, it's where you have the asymptotes that causes more of an issue or a discontinuity itself. But this one's not a discontinuity. Since the function is defined there, doing negative 8 to 0 and 0 to 8 would be an acceptable way to go about that, um, which is what we're going to do here. We're going to, at this corner, at x equals 0, we're going to cut off and just do from negative 4 to 0. And then we will do from 0 to 4. Um, so we will start off with what happens when x is less than 0, which is y equal. y equals x squared, right? Minus 4 times, if x is negative, what's the absolute value of x? Negative x negative x and then minus another x. So what is y equal when x is less than 0? x squared plus 4x minus x. So x squared plus 4x minus x or x squared plus 3x, right? What's the derivative of that? That's right, 2x plus 3. And what about over here? What about when x is greater than or equal to 0? What is y equal? x squared. And then if x is greater than or equal to 0, what's the absolute value of x? Just x. Just x, so minus 4x minus x, or y equals x squared minus 5x, or y prime equals 2x minus and so for the part on the left here, we should integrate from negative 4 to 0 
1 plus, sorry, the square root of 1 plus 2x plus 3 squared. And then we should add to that over here. the integral from 0 to 4 of the square root of 1 plus 2x minus 5 squared. Probably shouldn't forget my dx's. And what does that come out to be? Nineteen point five five six. Somebody else agree with that also? Yep. Oh good. Yep. Easy enough. That's the basics of arc length. Um we don't have much more time today. We get down at 27, right? So we got about 10 more minutes or so. Um a little more, little more than that. Um tomorrow we'll talk about dealing with this with vectors and parametric functions and polar functions. Um, so for now, this is good for just our regular rectangular functions. And just to sign out, how would we have integrated each of these if we didn't use our calculator to approximate them? Would you use sub? Yep, you just do a, you do a trig sub, right? You let 2x plus 3 equal tangent theta for this one. And you let 2x minus 5 equal tangent theta for this one. And so then you'd have 1 plus tangent squared, which would become a secant squared, which would do square root to become a secant, and so on. And you'd integrate secant with some constants and get that same natural log absolute value secant plus tangent that we got on that one previously. Good? Beautiful. Wonderful. All right, we will stop there for today.